All right, we're going to conclude the study and tonight's service with a discussion of the transfiguration scene in Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, to kind of just put it in context, is, takes place during the beginning of the year of opposition. Jesus had taught for about two years or so and had met with great success, but now the tides have kind of changed. He's now teaching in parables publicly. Uh, he's being resisted everywhere that he goes by uh, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. When you look at chapter 16, in the very first verse of chapter 16, the Bible says, Then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and test, testing him, asked him if he would show them a sign from heaven. First of all, Jesus has shown many signs from heaven. They're not wanting to see a sign for the sake of having faith. They're there to test him. This is the first time you see in scriptures Sadducees and Pharisees joining hands. I mean, these people hated each other, but they put aside their differences momentarily because they saw Jesus as a greater threat than they saw the other one. This means Jesus has reached quite a height of popularity, but they're now here to try to remove that from him. They're going to join forces to try to tear away the popularity from him. Uh, Jesus had recently fed the 5,000, and after the feeding of the 5,000, he taught a sermon that's recorded in John chapter 6 for the sake of driving people away. And he is intentionally bringing about some harder things of the gospel of the kingdom that people aren't wanting to hear, and he's revealing to them he's not quite the Messiah that they're wanting to receive. That's part of what the parables are all about. The kingdom's not going to be the type of kingdom that you're thinking about. It's going to start off small. It's going to take a long time to grow. It's going to get glorious. You're wanting something full-fledged, and you're wanting some vengeance and some judgment um, met out over all these nations surrounding you. That's not exactly what's going to be taking place within the kingdom. Now, in chapter 16, verse 13, you have an interesting question that comes along. Remember, it's the year of opposition, and so Jesus is kind of uh, taking a poll, if you will. Now, right now, we're going through an election season. And you have all these different polls that are coming out to see where's Donald Trump or where's Hillary Clinton in the polls and the rankings and what's public perception of them, what's their areas of strength and what's their areas of witness. That's kind of what Jesus is doing here. It says, when Jesus came in the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Who do people say that I am? Well, notice the answer. This isn't the typical answer that people have in their mind of Jesus. And so they said... Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Now, our society has a love-only, merciful, menta uh, soft, uh, easy-going Jesus pictured in their mind. But that's not the picture that the people of Jesus' day had of him. They're thinking, this man looks like John the Baptist. I mean, he's raking us over the coals whenever he comes around. John the Baptist, when he comes up, he, he starts off his conversation with the scribes and Pharisees. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Coincidentally, Je Jesus uses that same phrase in uh, Matthew chapter 23 after he's blasted them with eight woes or eight condemnations from God. Uh, maybe you're the new Elijah. We're, we're going to talk about the new Elijah, a theme here in chapter 17. But maybe you're the Elijah, maybe you're the reformer. Uh, that's coming. God's reforming his people. Or how about Jeremiah? Jeremiah, the prophet who preached for about 40 years with very little positive things to say, and he was just raking the people over, telling them to repent or judgment's coming down. They've gotten the message of judgment out of Christ. They've gotten that point, and they're kind of tired of it, and people are starting to resist him. So Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? What's the opinion of the disciples? And Peter steps forward, and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I don't know that Peter fully understands what he's stating there. One of the reasons I say that is because of the conversation that comes up in verse 21. In verse 21, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests of the scribes and be killed and raised the third day. That phrase introduces a kind of a transition verse. From that time, Jesus began. Um, in the five discourses, you know the discourse is over because when he had finished these things, now it's over, basically. That's the formula that's given. You see this formula occur twice from that time Jesus began. It occurs in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, and again here in Acts, I mean Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, and it's showing a forward movement in his mission. The first time he began to preach the gospel, now he's beginning to set his face to go to Jerusalem and die. So he's seeing his end fulfillment coming. 
Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. In one sentence, Peter's pronouncing the praise. You're the son of God. You're the Messiah. And the next one, Jesus is calling Peter the devil, the son of the devil. Now, it appears to me Peter didn't quite get everything about Jesus and about his mission. He's not fully understanding what's going on. But I, the reason Jesus offers such a hard rebuke is to say, look, I've set my face to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die there. It's going to be a difficult path getting there. The path to the cross was the most difficult path any man had ever traveled. And Jesus realizes that, and he set up his mind, and the devil is presenting a temptation to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, either go with me or get out of my way. I am going to Jerusalem, and I am going to do this, and nobody's going to keep me from it. My disciples are not going to discourage me. I am going to do the will of the Father. Now come and go with me or get out of the way. This is going to happen. Now with that in mind, look at chapter 17. We'll read chapter 17, verse 1, down through verse 9. Jacob, read that for me. 1 through 9. Okay. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces, for they were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. When he had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Okay. Side point, what's happening? Jesus is coming down from the mountain. This is a divine scene being pictured here. Okay? Um, I got a little bit ahead of myself, my nose, so I'll make two points before we jump into the explanation of chapter 17. Number one, the disciples do not comprehend how the topics of the coming of the kingdom and the giving of the keys to the kingdom and the topic of Jesus' death goes hand in hand. How can that be? You're going to establish a kingdom and you're going to give Peter the keys, but now you're going to go up to Jerusalem and you're going to die. How is that going to work? How does that go hand in hand? I believe that points us to what the purpose of this scene, the transfiguration scene is. It's going to show how those two go hand in hand, how the death and the kingdom must come about and how they are interconnected with each other. This trans, uh, transfiguration scene is a monumental, it's a pivotal moment in Jesus' career. And I think it's one that we don't pause and take enough time to ponder and appreciate what's happening in this scene. I want you to just look at the structure of what's going on. Before we do that, I want to make one point here. If you get nothing else out of the transfiguration scene, get this. In all of this, thing, in all of this scene, in all of Jesus' life, Jesus was doing the will of his Father. And if you get nothing else out of the transfiguration, get the scene, God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear him. God is well pleased with what Jesus has done in his mission thus far, and he is pleased with what Jesus is about to do, and he's about to fulfill. Now, a lot of people, pre dispensational premillennialists, act as if Jesus failed in his mission when he came to earth. Jesus came to reestablish physical Israel. But the Israelites rejected him, and they end up actually crucifying him. And so he has to set up the church as a stopgap momentarily until he can come back later and do what he meant to do the first time. That presents a weak Jesus. That presents man as being able to overthrow the power of God. But God says from the mountaintop, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is not a picture of failure. This is a picture of approval. God approves of what Jesus is doing. Now, if you'll notice here on the board, what you're having happen in Matthew chapter 17 in this picture is what's called a chiastic. It's a chiastic structure. In a chiastic structure, the first point parallels the last point. The second par point parallels the next to last point. 
The third point parallels the fifth point, and it all leads up to this section here in the middle. Okay? The narrative is introduced. Jesus is transfigured. Peter has a response. Then you hear the divine voice. It's kind of like walking up a mountain and then going back down the same way. When you hear the voice, then you hear a disciple's response. Then you hear Jesus speaking, and then the narrative is concluded. That's called a chiastic. It's an incredible structure that you see several times throughout Scripture. But the point I want you to get is it is emphasizing the divine voice. And so if you get nothing out else out of the, the, the picture, get the message of the divine voice. That's what Matthew is wanting to put the most emphasis on. Now, as you look at this scene in Matthew chapter 17, there are several things that are going on. First of all, what's being stressed is the authority and the glory of Jesus. Don't miss that. The authority and the glory of Jesus. And then number three, the victory of Jesus. Okay? Those are three important scenes. We'll talk first about the authority and glory, and then we'll talk last of all about the victory that will come down. I want to point out first of all, Moses and Elijah show up on the mountain together. Now why Moses and Elijah? We can understand Moses being there because a lot of the things that are depicted in this scene parallel events in the life of Moses. But why is Elijah there? Have you ever considered that? People have asked me that in the times past and I haven't always had a good answer for it. I hope that we can uh, explore that question a little bit and find a little bit better answer than maybe what you have right now. Why Moses and Elijah? Well, let's look at the life of Elijah for just a second here. Or let's look at the life of Moses, excuse me. Moses. Moses goes up on a mountain one time to receive some message from God. What happens in the... Well, I don't have the chart that I wanted. Oh, boy. Well... You talk about a Debbie Downer. I don't know where I don't know where it went. Well, that's the problem with technology sometimes. What you gonna do? Suffice it to say, I'll have to send you some notes sometime. There are nineteen parallels between the life of Elijah and Moses you see a lot of things that Elijah did that Moses also did. And he's paralleling the life of Moses. For instance, uh, Moses parts a river and the people walk across. Elijah parted the Jordan River and he and Elisha crossed it. After Moses had parted the river, later his, his follower or his follow-up, Joshua parted the Jordan River and the people crossed over again. After Elijah has gone away, Elisha parts the Jordan River and walks across. Um, Moses is taken up, uh, he dies on top of a mountain and nobody knows where he is, where his body was buried. Elijah is taken up to heaven and his disciples look around for several days trying to find out where his body was. You have uh, several scenes between uh, Moses going to Pharaoh and speaking to Pharaoh and Elijah going to before Ahab and speaking to Ahab. You have tons of parallels in the life of Moses and Elijah and I apologize for not having my charts now. This is going to be a lot shorter. But... 19 at least parallels. And what is being paralleled and shown in all the parallels between Elijah and Moses is that Elijah was, was in a way a second coming of Moses. And what I mean by that is Moses was a redeemer and he was a lawgiver and he was a mediator. Nobody paralleled him in those ways until Christ comes and becomes the new Moses according to Deuteronomy chapter 18. However, Elijah came along to reform the law of Moses. What Moses had established, the people got away from, and so Elijah comes along, and he is reinstituting the law of Moses, and he's telling people to get back to it. And he's doing a lot of things that Moses did in trying to help establish the law of God. The reason you see both Moses and Elijah up on the Mount of Transfiguration is because you have the lawgiver of the Old Testament, and then the great reformer of the Old Testament, both present. Jesus is neither teaching the law of Moses nor reforming the law of Moses. He's given his own new law, and he's outshining both of them. That's the reason you have Elijah up on the mountain. Coincidentally, Jesus is not the second coming of Elijah. 
After they get down off the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples come to him and they start asking him about Elijah. Why does Elijah have to come first? And Jesus says, Elijah has already come. And they realize he's speaking to them of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the second coming of Elijah, not Jesus. Jesus is the new and the greater Moses. He is not the reformer of Moses. And that's why Elijah shows up on the mountain alongside of Moses. Now, in this charts that we do have, thankfully, look at the scenes that are being paralleled here in the scene of the transfiguration. Moses is up there on Sinai. He goes up the mountain to receive the law. Jesus and his disciples also go up the mountain. There's going to be a scene that takes place. And number two, Moses takes three servants with him up on the mountain. You have Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. Oh, Nadab and Abihu. They got to see an awesome thing, and then they got struck down later for having offered profane fire. However, Jesus takes three servants up with him, Peter, James, and John. This is paralleling the events in the life of Moses. Uh, God spoke to Moses after six days. The Bible specifically says in Exodus chapter 24 and verse 16. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 17 verse 1 that God spoke to Jesus after six days. Now in Luke's account, Luke chapter 9 verse 28, the Bible says about eight days after these sayings. In other words, God spoke to Jesus after eight days. And people say, now there's a contradiction, Nathan. Uh, Luke says after eight days, Matthew says after six days, they, they got the facts wrong here. Here's a, here's a discrepancy in scripture. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. Eight days is after six days. There's no problem with that. The reason Matthew says after six days is he's wanting to remind the people of what happened to Moses after six days. He's drawing a parallel here between the life of Christ and that of Moses. The Bible says that the face of Moses shone brightly. Exodus chapter 34, verse 32 through 35. The Bible recounts in Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, that both the face and the garments of Jesus shone brightly. In Exodus chapter 22, verses 15 through 19, it appears that the Shekinah glory came and rested above Mount Sinai as Moses is up on top of that mountain. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, there's a br bright cloud like the Shekinah glory that appears once again over the mountain, and God speaks from the midst of that cloud. Now, what all is being depicted there is that Jesus is like unto Moses. He's drawing a new Moses comparison, if you will. From the midst of this cloud, God speaks out and he says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Now this is a combination of three passages. God is echoing three passages. I want to look at those passages together. Look at Psalm chapter 2 verse 7. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, Cody, where did we read that earlier? This quotation, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Where, where have we read that before? Mike? Matthew, no, you're almost there. Matthew 3. When Jesus is baptized and he comes up out of the water, God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now they're up on the mountain, and God repeats that same statement, and he adds a little phrase to it where he says, Hear ye him. Okay? The first part of it comes from Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. If you remember from Monday night, this is the enthronement passage. God is placing his stamp of approval upon his son, who is the new David king. This is the enthronement passage. The day of a king was born, uh, a prince was born, was the day that he began to take the throne. Jesus is ascend ascending to the throne of heaven, and God is recognizing that and declaring him his son. Number two, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. This is reflecting again that same baptism scene that we talked about the other night. God placed his spirit upon Jesus, and he's declaring, this is the one who, in whom my soul delights. Coincidentally, the phrase beloved son, when Jesus, God says this is my beloved son, that's a difficult phrase to translate from the original language into to English. And the best scholars can come up with is that this is a uniquely loved son. This is a one-of-a-kind son who shares in a special relationship with the father. So you have this one-of-a-kind son in whom the father is delighting, who is ascending to the throne, and then he says from Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet from uh, for you, a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. 
There's going to be a prophet that comes up through Israel that the people have to listen to. A prophet like Moses, like the lawgiver, like the first redeemer, like the first mediator. That's the role that Jesus was going to fulfill. And so God is echoing this passage and he's saying, this is the one. This is my son who's going to take up the throne. This is my son in whom I am well pleased, upon whom I have placed my spirit. This is my son that you must listen to. He's bringing new law. Okay? There's several things within the scene that I want you to take into consideration. Number one, Jesus is fulfilling this prophecy right here. And the whole scene is meant to depict this. It depicts Jesus as the new and greater than Moses. Okay? He's not just like Moses. He far outshines Moses in everything that he does. Moses was the best depiction that, that, that a man could bring about to look forward to the Messiah, but it frailed in comparison to the actual Messiah when he arrives in the aspects that Moses could relay. Number two, Jesus is picked, depicted in all the scene as being far superior. Notice um, Moses' face shone whenever he comes down from the mountain. He has to place a bag over it so that the people can't see it fading away. But Jesus, it's not only his face shining, but it's his clothes shining. In other words, he is radiating his own light. He's not reflecting the light of God. He's producing his own light, and his disciples are allowed to see it. He's not just declared to be a prophet of God. He's declared to be the son of God, and he's going to be the son that is reigning within the new kingdom. Jesus' message is being declared as greater than the law and the prophets and going to be its replacement. Moses and Elijah were the only two men who had spoken to God on a mountain. They had to have their back turned to him. They received some blessings while they were on that mountain. Moses received the law and Elijah gets commissioned to go forth and to reform the law. They represent together the law and the prophets. And what is being depicted here when God says, Hear ye him is that the law and the prophets are going away and you need to listen to Jesus and the law that he has brought about. Now, I hope we don't miss that scene. Listen to him. Whenever they come down off the mountain, they says, tell this vision no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Now why would they get to see this and they don't get to tell anything about it? Well, there's two reasons I believe for this. Number one, it's not till after Jesus resurrects that the law is fully going to go into effect. And so they need, that hear ye him comes into play after he resurrects. And uh, number two, I may have lost it in my mind. Things slip away sometimes. Um, yeah, it's gone. It's not going to come back. I blame it on age or a long week. I don't know. Anyhow. From atop the mountain, the law of Moses is being depicted as coming to an end. Jesus doesn't want them going forth and preaching things that they know not what of. But there, it's come back to me now. Here we go. They don't go forth and start telling this scene because they don't understand the scene fully and they're not going to understand, uh, understand the scene fully until after Jesus has resurrected from the dead. Part of that is the nature of the law and the nature of the kingdom. But part of it, I believe, is part of what's being depicted by Christ himself, uh, by God himself referencing the victory of Christ. Now God knows in, in, setting, in the setting here in chapter 16, Jesus is in a situation where he's losing popularity. And the disciples could easily be discouraged. They're not going to understand a lot of things that are going on. Jesus is telling them, we're going to go up to Jerusalem. I'm going to get crucified. And they're, they're having some struggles with that. Why is it that he's got to go and die? And so God gives them this scene. He allows three of the disciples to see it. And this is going to make sense to them after Jesus has gone to Jerusalem and he has died. But they're having struggles right now. And so this is kind of what I would call the glory before shame moment. Whenever they get to Jerusalem, Jesus is going to be arrested and he's going to be mocked and he's going to be beaten and he's going to be taken out. He's going to be crucified and the disciples are going to be there and they're going to be confused. 
and they're going to be scared to death and they're going to be scattered and they're going to be feeling like everything's hopeless and everything's been lost. And so before they get to that state, for their sake and for the sake of Christ, God gives them this scene and he's saying, this is my son and I'm pleased with him. After Jesus dies, they need to hold on to that thought because it's going to bring them some comfort and bring them some motivation once Jesus has resurrected from the dead. That brings us to our next point, the victory. This is a scene, this is glory before shame. God is recognizing Jesus is the victor in this scene. He's not the defeated Christ that they're about to witness. He is the victor. And he is going to sit down on the throne and the law is going to go forth and he is going to reign in the kingdom. Hear him. Listen up to this Christ. The victory doesn't seem apparent to us. We don't focus on that very much. But I want to notice, look at Luke chapter 9 verse 31. Josiah, read this for us. Luke chapter 9 verse 31. and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Okay. That word decease there is an important phrase. This gets, lets us to see in the conversation that Jesus is having with Moses and Elijah. Can you imagine being in Moses and Elijah's shoes? They show up and they get to talk to the Messiah. This is the one they were looking forward to. Moses knows that his law pointed forward to Christ. Elijah knows that he did his work so that people could recognize Christ. This is the law and the prophets being represented. And they get to talk to the one whom they were looking forward to. Now the disciples on this scene, they're excited, not because Jesus is there, but because Moses and Elijah are back from the dead. And they get to witness two great patriarchs. And that makes it a special event. And Peter says, well, you know, we got Moses and Elijah here. Let's build a tabernacle for each one. Let's recognize three great prophets. And God said, no, you listen to my son. Peter had been with Jesus for so long, he'd forgot who Jesus was, kind of. He forgot that this was the Son of God and that the Son is greater than any prophet that's come before. And so God's pointing out specifically his Son. But what do they talk about? It says they spoke about his decease. That word can also be translated departure or exodus. Moses wants to know about the exodus that's coming. Now Moses led the first exodus from the bondage of slavery in Egypt and he wants to know about the next exodus that's coming that Jesus is leading out of the bondage of sin. He wants to know about the victory that's coming. God's going to reveal some things about the victory. In Matthew chapter 17 verse 6 the Bible says, And when the disciples heard it they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. When they heard God's voice speaking, they were afraid and they fell down and they were trembling. Now that phrase, greatly afraid, is an important phrase, I believe. It's used twice by Matthew. It's used once here in the transfiguration scene, and it's used a second time over in Matthew chapter 27, verse 54. Read that for us, Jacob. Matthew 27, verse 54. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly this was the Son of God. So even Gentiles, there are these Gentile soldiers that are standing there, and they see all that's happening when Jesus is crucified on the cross. They recognize that it's gone black in the middle of the day. They're feeling the earthquake beneath them. They're seeing the thunder and the lightning. God is impressing his presence upon the world and he's letting them know this is my son. And even Gentiles could recognize surely this had to be the son of God and they are greatly afraid. They are falling down in fear and trembling at the presentation of the son of God. A similar scene is what is being depicted up there atop the mountain. God's demonstrating his presence in a frightening way on both occasions. And both occasions are looking forward to a message from God. God is saying in one explicitly, this is my son, listen to him. And the other one he's implying, this is my son whom you have just crucified. 
There's two other details between this scene at, at the tra- Mount of Transfiguration and at the crucifixion. Number one, there is the presence of three named witnesses on both the Mount of Transfiguration and at the cross. Maybe that's coincidental, maybe it's not. There's also the number of six plays a prominent role in both scenes in Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, after six days, and in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, after, during the sixth hour, God began to speak. But more than that, I believe what's happening is you're having a pictorial antithetical parallel that's drawn. Now, there's not a term you hear very often. We don't use that all the time. A pictorial antithetical parallel. That's a picture of contrasts that Matthew's drawing. We can see this, this contrast being drawn. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus is the one who's doing the leading, and he is leading his disciples up the mountain to receive the message. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 31, Jesus is taken up to the Mount of Gol- to, to Golgotha so that God can send a message to the world message of hope and salvation. In Matthew 17, 1, there is a private epiphany. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 39, there is a public spectacle. Two great contrasts. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, there is great light overshadowing everything. Yet in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, God sucks out all the light to let people know his displeasure with them. Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, the garments of Christ are illuminated and add to his glory. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 28 and 35, Jesus' garments are stripped off of him to add to his shame. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, 17, verse 2, Jesus is glorified. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 27, Jesus is shamed and mocked. And one, God's doing the glorifying, and the other, It's man given the ultimate shame, the crucifixion on the cross. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 3, Elijah appears speaking with Moses and with Christ. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 45 through 50, they're asking, is Elijah going to show up? Is Elijah going to come here and save him? Matthew chapter 17, verse 3, two saints are on either side of Jesus. Two saints from the past. Here on this other mountain... There are two criminals, one on either side of Christ. How greater of a contrast. How great a contrast. In one passage, God audibly confesses him, Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. In the other scene, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God's present, but he's not speaking audibly on this occasion. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 6, the people fall down in reverent prostration before the Son of God, the King. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 9, they stand and they mock the only begotten Son of God. And they ridicule Him and they spit upon Him with no no recognition for the deity who stands, who is hanging, dying for their life. The transfiguration scene in Matthew chapter 17 is anticipating the crucifixion scene in Matthew 27. The disciples do not understand how the establishment of the kingdom comes with the, with the death of Christ. They're going to understand it after it all takes place, but atop the mountain, when the transfiguration takes place, God is wanting to give Jesus glory because he's going to receive the ultimate shame from men. Whenever you look at Jesus high and lifted up on the cross, always think back to chapter 17 and recognize Jesus high and lifted up by God to his glory. Jesus was the triumphant, the victorious Savior. And that's the Savior that God wanted the people to see. He says, go and tell no one until after these things have happened, until after he has resurrected this was the message that people go, that the disciples went forth with. And they were excited. They were thrilled. I want to close by reading 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 through 18. 
For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on that holy mountain. Years down the road, this scene is standing out in Peter's mind. And he's saying, God, I believe in Christ because this is the Son of God. This was deity. This is the one who God approved. This was the victor. And on that day up on the mountain, we got to see Christ in his glory, emitting his own life as the Son of God, the victor. Whenever you see Christ on the cross, this is not defeat. It's the way to victory. And the victory was declared beforehand. I hope you'll take these thoughts and you'll consider them and that maybe we'll have a greater appreciation of what's taking place up there on the Mount of Transfiguration. Any questions or comments from any of the brethren on this material? Again, I apologize. If, if you want the slides depicting the... I can't remember right now off the top of my head if it's 19 or 23. I think I counted them the other day. I'd said there were 19. I think there's about 23 of them. But between... Elijah and Moses. I think it's important to see that contrast and to understand that Elijah is representing the reformation of the law of Moses. That's important because when we talk with our no exception brethren, they say Jesus comes reforming the law. That was not Jesus' job. That was Elijah's job. And that was John's job. And they did their job. Jesus isn't coming because John the Baptist failed his mission. John the Baptist was the greatest man born among women. Jesus is coming to bring new law. And our brethren have missed that point, and it's caused division amongst our people. We're not appreciating the scene atop the mountain when God speaks and he says, listen to my son. Listen to the law that he's brought, the new Moses. That's an important, important thing throughout the Gospel of Matthew, the new David and the new Moses. We've talked about that, and it's touched on almost every aspect, either explicitly or implied through our study this week. And I hope that you will go home, and you'll think more about Jesus as the new Moses, Jesus as the new David. He is the lawgiver. He's the redeemer. He's the savior. He's the king. And what an awesome privilege to be in the kingdom of heaven, the one that the Son of God brought down, the kingdom of God in which he sits on the throne right now reigning over his people. We appreciate you coming out tonight, being with us. For those who have come out throughout the week, uh, these have been recorded in both audio format and video format. We're hopeful to post them online. It's going to be probably after the 4th of July meeting until we get that done, but uh, they should be on both my site and Dad's website. And um, if you have any questions about this material, uh, you can feel free to ask us and go online, watch the videos. If you miss some, uh, download the notes that are provided and um, I want to echo again, there's two books over here that I've recommended twice. There's Charles Quarles book on a theology of Matthew, and he does an outstanding job of talking about those themes, the new Moses and the new David theme. And I highly recommend that. I don't think we've appreciated that very much through the years, and um, there's some really good material there. And then the other book is God With Us by D.A. Carson, and he's showing the big picture of Matthew and how the scenes kind of flow together. I think Carson's really good on that. Um, he's wrong on Matthew 24. He gets about the first half of 24 right, and then he gets the rest of it wrong. So that's just kind of a heads up on that. Um, but I think in my personal studies, this is my confession, I guess, my personal studies, I haven't done a very good job in the past of connecting the big picture of things. And I think it's very helpful to see a new Moses theme flowing through the gospel or a new David theme flowing through the gospel. It helps us understand uh, better some of the teaching. It also shows us how pieces of the teaching connect together and you have a flow to the gospel. And so I'd encourage you to read, read that material and to check out the videos and the audio that's posted online.